associates with your group. According to my notes, we finished with the Mary Jane section, and we were about to talk about the Maureen Peel section. So that's on page 61. Who was my group 61? Did we start it? Yes. Okay, good. I'm sorry. I do it four times and I can't remember each time when I did it. I'm sorry. Do you have an answer to what? Uh, I don't have one. It's actually not a handout. It was a group assignment. So it's, it's just a thing that you were, that people filled out. So we talked about the dad's face in winter. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. okay. And then did we talk about Maureen? No. We started. All right. So remind me what we said about Maureen. And what would you like to say about Maureen? She's a white skin girl. And she's a rich. And she was kind of popular in the school. And the boys were kind of afraid of her. Good. And um, she, some, some, she somehow, like, some boys were picking on, on the color. And somehow she just felt the sympathy for her and tried to protect her. So she told the, the boys to go away. And she invited her and Phil and Claudia to go buy them ice cream. Good. But Phil and Claudia, was, they were like really hating her. And they, I think Frida was hating her even more because she didn't buy her an ice cream. <laughs> she only bought an ice cream for mm. Coca-Cola. Yeah. Good. Okay, good. So that's a good, that's a long plot summary, right? That's a plot of what went on. That's excellent. That's exactly right. And now we want to move to the level of the analysis, which is the way you do it in your midterms, right? You start with the plot, the summary, and then you go to the analysis. Can we talk about how we first meet Maureen on page 62? The disruptor of seasons. Remember, we were talking about winter in the dad's face? That beautiful metaphor, and there's a simile there, too, about his face, how his face is winter. And this disruptor of seasons was a new girl in school named Maureen Peel, a high yellow dream child with long brown hair braided into two lynch ropes that hung down her back. Why is it significant to describe her braids as lynch ropes? Because she has many black people wear lynch. Right. What kind of a crime is a lynching? It's murder. It's murder. It's murder, but it's a racial hate crime, right? <laughs> So what does that give us in terms of a feeling about Maureen? I'm going to concentrate on my group here. I'm not ignoring you. I love you all. But what, is, what does that give us as a feeling about Maureen? That she's not black to you. Yeah, it makes us feel nervous about it, yeah. her, doesn't it? That she seems nice on the outside, but it might, she might be, there might be something going on there that we should worry about, right? And then tell me about how she looks. How does she look? No. She's light-skinned. She's described as high yellow. She's light -skinned. She's black, but she's light-skinned. What color are her eyes? Green. Green. They're slow green, she tells us. What else is green about her? Her remember Her socks. Her she's socks. got green socks. And she's the kind of girl whose socks are always pulled up, right? They never fall down, like everybody else's, right? And what are her lunches like? She has peanut butter and jelly. No, she's better than peanut butter and jelly. Her lunches are so good that even Pecola's lunch is ashamed of itself. I mean, Claudia's lunch, listen. She never had to search for anybody to eat with in the cafeteria. This is uh, Maureen. They flocked to the table of her choice, where she opened fastidious lunches, shaming our jelly sand bread with egg salad sandwiches cut into four dainty squares, pink frosted cupcakes, stocks of celery and carrots, proud dark apples. She even bought and liked white milk. I even felt ashamed of the lunch I packed my kids when I read that <laughs> description. I mean, that is a sandwich, you know, the, the corners cut off. You know, even the other girls, peanut, you know, it's just jelly stained bread. It's ashamed of itself. So how, the, how does Maureen make these girls feel? Our girls, Claudia and Bruce. They feel inferior, Matthias. Right, and then that actually leads on to a little further down that paragraph. And then um, the girls, since they're kind of like, they feel like that, then they start trying to find ways to make themselves feel better. Yeah. So they look for flaws in Maureen, and then uh, they actually come up with a name for her, and it's like, right? Uh, six feet of dogs five. Five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can already see how they feel about her, and then that leads. Exactly, that's great. She's the disruptor of seasons. 
right? What is the disruptor of seasons? What disrupts winter? You guys don't know because you summer. live in LA. Summer. Not summer. I mean, um, spring. Spring. And it's spring. yellow, and it represents yellow, the sun. It's yellow, right? It's, she's high yellow. What are the colors of spring? Green. Think, think Easter. Green. She's got her green eyes. She's got her green socks. Yellow. Maureen is spring, isn't she, in a way? Yeah. Even her sandwich, I would argue, is egg salad, right? We think of eggs and chicks on Easter, right? <laughs> she is this disruptor of winter. And we're told later on after this description of her perfect patent leather shoes and uh, fluffy sweaters, the color of lemon drops, right? It's all this Easter stuff and Easter candy kind of. Uh, there, sorry, I'm missing my spot. Ah, we're told that she is, hold on, I'm missing. Sorry, following page, excuse me. Following page, I'm 64. It was a false spring day, which, like Maureen, had pierced the shell of a deadening winter. There were puddles, mud, and an inviting warmth that diluted us. The kind of day on which we draped our coats over our heads, left our galoshes in school, and came down with croup the following day. What's a false spring day? It doesn't stay, it's just sort of like a pretense or just a tease. Yeah, again, this is something you know if you live where it's cold, right? Because there's winter, and all of a sudden one day, there's a hot day. And there still might even be some snow and patches on the ground. But all the flowers think, okay, it's safe to come out now. They poke their foreheads out of the snow, right? And then what happens the next day? It freezes over and everything's dead, right? How is Maureen like a false spring day? Yeah, everything in life is kind of lying. False spring. I think that uh, she did it for a reason that protection, she wanted it also something out of it. She didn't just do it out of goodness when she protected because she wanted it to talk to those girls because later on she she was talking about the dad and yeah, in the fall, spring day, the girls do what? They take off their coats, yeah. they think it's safe and warm, and they're going to have a great time. And then they get sick. They get they come down with proof because they took off their coats, right? Yeah. Patricia. And Maureen came across as pretty and nice and kind, but then again, she betrays them, so that's exactly. the fall, spring day. Exactly. She starts up, is that what you're going to say, Remy? Yeah. She starts off all sunshine, and it's going to be great, and let's get ice cream, and it's all fine, right? And then at the end, she is what? She's slain her racial slurs, right? Black and most. She runs across the street. I'm cute and you're not. She's that frost then that freezes over that moment. Yeah. You make yourself is, feel is she way. half white? She's, uh, I don't think she's half white. I think she's just light skin. Oh, I don't know. I think that there's someone that was somewhere down the line. In her family, in the past. She may have. That's certainly, we have a character who does have that situation too. <laughs> That's so pet. So pet. So pet church for sure is biracial. I don't know if she's biracial. I don't. It may have said way back when she might have. But here it just tells us how you. Um, so I feel like they're even more betrayed, right? Because they're expecting to be safe, maybe, uh, or could expect. Good. So I didn't mean to cut you off, Matthias, with Mariah Kai. Why do you think she's called Mariah Kai? Um. Not really sure. Um. That's a hard one. I'm not sure either, to tell you the truth. I, I like to talk about it, though. It's it's yellow. Yellow. Could it's be bitter sweet. Bittersweet. What does Mariah Kai look like? It's it's nice. it's okay, it's lemon, so she's high yellow, right? But it's also, it's got that white on the top, right? And then the fluffy white, is it all white? No, it's kind of brown on the top, isn't it? It's kind of light brown on the outside, but white on the inside. I don't know what kind of pie is this. If you ever, it's not that common, but if you ever go to a diner, <laughs> it's not a pie. I don't know if that's why she's named that, but I wonder. I wonder, this sort of light brown on the outside, but kind of white inside, that she's got this kind of racism in her. But we know for sorry, go ahead. I said even the name itself, they try to bat her, but it's like really... It's, a pie. it's still a pie. It's still yeah. sweet. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing that bad about it. That's right. Good. They treat her like what? They're, they say, they talk about her unearned haughtiness. Unearned. Why should it be earned? Well, they're frustrated by the fact that she's just born with all this great stuff. Her socks stay up. She gets egg salad. How come? She's just born that way. She's really lucky, right? And it feels unearned. 
Just like if people are nice around her. Just like the doll, right? Everyone says this doll is the perfect thing, but why? Who said it? It's the same kind of feeling, and it's almost like Maureen is a little bit like the doll come to life here, isn't it? Um, with that under haughtiness. On page 65, what's happening to Coca-Cola? The boys are picking on her. Why, why are they picking on her? Because of her skin, because she has dark skin, and they want to fit, make themselves feel better. Yeah. They're also black, and uh, they just want to make fun of her. Like she, she likes to watch her dad naked. Right. And, uh, it's like taking the, the bad feeling out of themselves. Yeah. On her. Yeah. Do you remember we talked about sacrifice? Did I write scapegoat, scapegoat on the board before? Yeah. What's a scapegoat? Someone. You give it to the April. Someone that you can put all the blame on. Yeah, someone who gets the blame. It's, it's the literal word for, for sacrifice in a way. Uh, it's that goat that we go up and sacrifice, right, up on the mountaintop because we've been bad so that the gods don't kind of get mad at us. They put the blame on that person, right? And so when you scapegoat somebody today, it's when you give someone the blame for something that you've done or something that you're feeling, right? Nicola is repeatedly a scapegoat. When is she literally a scapegoat? When does she take the blame for something she didn't do? Ingrid. When the kid kills yeah, with that horrible cat incident, right? She literally takes the blame for what Junior does. And she is, she's made into a scapegoat. Here, they're using the word, Tony Morrison uses the word sacrifice. These boys are, are attacking her. They had extemporized a verse made up of two insults about matters over which the victim had no control. The color of her skin. Sorry, I lost my place. And speculations on the sleeping habits of an adult. Wildly fitting in its incoherence, because one thing you can't control is your parents, right? You can't help what your parents do. That they themselves were black, the boys, or that their own father had similarly relaxed habits was irrelevant. It was their contempt for their own blackness that gave the first insult its teeth. They seemed to have taken all their smoothly cultivated ignorance, their exquisitely learned self-hatred, their elaborately designed hopelessness, and sucked it all up into a fiery cone of scorn that had burned for ages in the hollows of their minds, cooled and spilled over lips of outrage, consuming whatever was in its path. They danced a macabre ballet around the victim, whom, for their own sake, they were prepared to sacrifice to the flaming pit. So attacking her, the sacrifice, is to make themselves feel better, right? Even though they have exactly the same situation possibly as she does, she's victimized. Why? Because they sense that she has less power than they do in this situation. Until what happens? Until Maureen. Until Maureen. Oh, That's right. <coughs> it was Frida. It was Frida, and they weren't going to back down, right? But Maureen's arrival, because she's pretty, makes them say, OK, forget it. No, we don't have time for that. Right, we don't have time for that. Good. Excellent. Well, did you guys have anything else to say about your patients? It ends badly. There is that great moment where Frida and Claudia were completely expecting, you know, let's go get ice cream there. Great. Right. Then they get in and she says, oh, are you going to buy any? Right? <laughs> and yeah. we feel that. The only we get, we get the taken in, too. Yeah. As the readers, it didn't occur to us for a second that she wasn't going to pay for them also, right? So we feel the same way she does. Like, uh oh, yeah, that's embarrassing. We <laughs> were expecting her to pay, right? It's a heartbreaking moment. It is a heartbreaking moment. And Poor Coca-Cola, right? Every moment she thinks, we think for her it's going to be positive, yeah. turns negative, right? Good. Good job. Uh, just one quick thing on page 74. So can I ask you a question? Absolutely. So basically she saves the, the scapegoat from the voice, but then because she wants to take it, it's like moves. Like, OK, I'm going to take the meat. So I can eat it. So she kind of saved her so she can feed her own uh, insecurity and she can do the same thing with the boys were doing to her, but she kind of did it for herself to, to get her own insecurities on her. Well, and what we realize is that she has just the same racism right. you know, that we think she does, and not right? Yeah. But she's, you know, calling them racial epithets, right? Black, you know. Yeah. So it's exactly what you don't expect from her exterior. And it brings back that question, too, of expecting you know, virtue to equal beauty. 
beautiful people aren't the good people, even though Cola has made that idea in her mind, right, that ugly is bad, it's not. Here we have someone who's not, there's a nice exterior, but it's not, nothing is bad. That's right. Good. Uh, the only thing I wanted to mention to you quickly on page 74, Jealousy we understood and thought natural, a desire to have what somebody else had, but envy was a strange new feeling for us. And all the time we knew that Maureen Peel was not the enemy and not worthy of such intense hatred. The thing to fear was the thing that made her beautiful and not us. And so that thing, you guys have something there? No, I, I, said, I thought about that too. I think it's um, um, discrimination, the feeling of hate. Well, and that thing, it's again that arbitrary decision that somebody makes mm -hmm. to say Maureen's beautiful and worthy and you're not, right, because of the way you're born. Good, excellent. Uh, okay, how about page, I think my next pages are 81? 81 to 86? this funk, they wipe it away. Where it crusts, they dissolve it. Wherever it drips, flowers or clings, they find it and fight it until it dies. They fight this battle all the way to the grave. The laugh that is a little too loud, the enunciation a little too round, the gesture a little too generous. They hold their behind in for fear of a sway too free. When they wear lipstick, they never cover the entire mouth for fear of lips too thick. And they worry, worry, worry about the edges of their hair. <coughs> Is it safe to say that the hair might be that they're afraid of being a little bit too black, their hair being a little bit too curly? Uh, it's, almost, it's almost like a foreshadow of how, of how they were being explained, and then this comes in, and it's like a foreshadow to how they, from, how they are with their family. Yeah, and how are they with their families? It's, um, they, uh, I don't think I explained that one, but... Um, Basically, for other. <laughs> basically, like it says here that they, um, what they do not know is that this plain brown girl will build her nest stick by stick, make it her own inviolable world, and stand guard over it. It's every plant we need and thoroughly, even against him, <coughs> him meaning her husband. Her basically, like she'll like, she'll pro she's protecting her home even against her own husband, and yeah. it's not the way she wants it to be. And, She'll go against the odds and get it the way she wants it to be. Yeah. It also talks about how, I don't know, it was like this part where the husband does something and just with one look, 
He knows nothing. Yeah, what else? We're all skirting around the elephant in the room. Um, Sorry, I, I you got your hand up before. Will they help children? They make sure they're well grown, small yeah. and but yet they don't talk to them and don't show infection and stuff. Yeah, how does she act towards her own son, Junior? She has more patience for the cat. She likes the cat better than her son, is what it tells us. And so how does Junior react to that? Yeah. In case the cat. Remember, what are our two choices? We've got the doll. What are our two choices? We feel unworthy. This doll makes us feel less than. What are our two choices for how we react? We hate it or we love it and we want to be it. Right? Those are our two choices. So Junior obviously can't be a cat. So he hates that cat because it's taking all the affection that he feels is his due. That is his due. Not only is it a cat, but a cat with blue eyes. Yeah. So it really like it's a cherry on top. Yeah, it's a black cat with blue eyes. Why do you think she put in that detail to have the blue eyes for the black cat? Pacola. Yes. So how does that work for Pacola? She sees the beauty of the black cat, but then she also sees the blue eyes and she basically feels like why does this cat have black eyes blue eyes and not eyes? Well, how does she feel towards the cat? Angry Peter. She likes the cat, right? She's even willing to, you know, suspend her horror of being tortured by this awful Junior, right, to pet the cat. And Junior sees her petting the cat and is so upset that, for, you know, she doesn't even care that he's torturing her for a moment. And that gesture reminds him so much of what? His mom. His mom, His mom ignoring him petting the cat. Ingrid. I think he also looks for affection with the kids as well. Yeah. Because he always wants to play with them and make them not go home. Yes, yes. So he's really lacking affection, right? So could it be, I would argue perhaps, that this black cat is meant to be kind of a stand-in almost for Pacola too, right? The, the cat is sort of what Pacola wants to be. And he, he hates Pacola. Why? Why does he pick on Pacola? Because she's weaker. She's weaker. And what makes him think she's weaker? Because she's not here. He's like, yeah, come to my house. Come, and then she just goes for it, like... Well, she's by herself, she's by not herself. protected. And she goes for it, like, so easy, like, it's easy to trick her. So he already knows, well, I didn't have to work so hard. Why do you think he targets her? She was the only one on the... Maybe because she's alone, and how does Geraldine... <clears throat> what kind of assumptions does Geraldine make about her, based on her looks? She doesn't like her. She calls her a nigger. She's funny. Her whole hair's dressed as big. All right, let's back up. Let's back up a little bit. The very, were you using something, Dan? Okay, I didn't mean that. Don't, don't forget. They come from Mo Mobile, Aiken, from Newport News, from Marietta, from Meridian. I'm on page 81. 61. 81. 81. From Meridian. And the sound of these places in their mouths make you think of love. When you ask them where they are from, they tilt their heads and say, Mobile, and you think you've been kissed. They say, Aiken, and you see a white butterfly glance off the fence with a torn wing. They say, Nagadochis, and you want to say, yes, I will. You don't know what these towns are like, but you love what happens to the air when they open their lips and let the names ease out. What is she talking about here? What's beautiful? The way they look. The way they look? What's beautiful here, Dana? Um, the way they carry themselves, I guess, like in a sense. Very specifically, she's talking about one sense here. What is it? The sound. The sound, the sound of these words, right? You may never have been to Nagadochis, but when you hear that word, you want to say, yes, I will, because it's so beautiful. She's saying, the sound of these towns, the way they sound is so beautiful that they make you think of love, she tells us. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Are these women loving? No. no, they're not. How do they act with, when they're having sex? Call, call, call. Yeah, oh, is my curler coming out? Okay, when's this going to be done, right? She has that whole passage, right? It's not love. She doesn't love her son. She's much happier with the cat, right? Yeah, I was going to ask you, what was that thing about, like, this emotion, like, even the tip of the cat, it just kind of, like, turns her on, kind of, like, Kind of. It's like she's having sex with a cat, kind of, no? Kind of, because I think she feels like, well, it's neater, it's cleaner, it's on her terms, right? 
Tony Morrison's not afraid to go there a little bit. That suggestion is certainly there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 She prefers the cat to everybody in her life. It could, if it could just be her with her beautiful house and the cat, she'd be just fine, right? Happier. And happier. And happier. Uh, and because she's able to control that. So, of course, Junior has to attack that cat, right? Because that cat is taking all the affection that he wants for himself. I think Toni Morrison includes this section in the book to make clear that it's not just poverty that makes parents bad parents, right? She has provided for every material desire he could have. He's got a beautiful home. She makes sure he's well fed and all of his needs are met. She never lets him cry as a baby, right? But still, she's a lacking parent. And I think we could say probably pretty, with, with a lot of good authority, that her thesis in this book is that kids need what? Love. Attention and love. And it doesn't really matter if you're rich or you're poor or how, it, how you're able to deliver that. But if that love is lacking, it creates a generation of angry kids and violent kids, right? Um, Good. So tell me about uh, Geraldine's racism. Is she black? Mm -hmm. Yes, she's black. But is she a racist? Yes. Absolutely. What does she think? What does she decide? Remember our appeal to prejudice, our logical fallacy, uh, guilt by association, or hasty generalization? Yeah? Um, she says that colored people are more um, neat and Better than niggers who are like dirty and loud. Yeah, and that's the word she uses, right? Uh, and so she categorizes people based on probably more of the money that they have than anything else. Um, like I was, when I was reading that part right there, um, and then I went back or whatever, I think uh, the reason why a lot of the kids were the way they were is because of their parents. Like, I really think that kids, you know, picked up. Just for example, like the little boys that picked up you know, the color, yeah. you know, they were black. Or I think a lot of the kids were prejudiced that were black were prejudiced because they learned from their parents, you know, you know, black is ugly and sure. And but I, like a Maureen, she was I didn't understand. It was really weird to me that Maureen is black or whatever, and you know, she's the same thing as Pacola and Claudia and Frida. She's just a lighter version of them, and they look. You know, and they blocked her like, oh, you know, she's so much better, but not really realizing that she's the same kind. I mean, she's the same as they are. She's just a lighter version of what they are. I, I really, I just thought that when I read that passage that I really started to feel like I think a lot of the kids acted the way they act because they, and they picked up their prejudice from their parents because sure. they seen what their parents did. Isn't that what happens? Isn't that where kids get prejudice, right? And I don't think kids are born being, if you see kids on the playground, they play with whoever is nice, right? They don't care at all what the color of the people's skin, and they don't notice my, I notice actually, obviously, because I teach this book and I'm interested in these questions, I noticed my youngest daughter would come home and tell me about her friends, and never once mentioned their race, and then it would always be an interesting, you know, to see that she just, it didn't occur to her to mention it, whereas adults, it feels like it's almost the first thing that we think of, because we're, you know, conditioned that way, right? Um, so absolutely, it's the parents that pass on this idea, and, this, and, and pass on ideas about self-worth and who you are and all of those things, right? And remember, this is, uh, you know, in the era of fade creams, right? They're just trying to, so the idea is lighter's better. That's what's being sold to you lock, stock, and barrel everywhere you turn. So she definitely feels better about herself because she's lighter, right? And people treat her differently. Isn't that really the, that shows the pervasive racism everywhere? Good. Um, so this terrible, terrible thing with the cat, right? It's awful, too, that we feel bad for the cat, almost as bad as we feel for Pecola, right? That's human nature. I think we always feel for the innocent uh, animals. And, uh, and poor Pecola, right? What does this episode foreshadow? What episode later is foreshadowed by this killing of the cat? Uh, Pecola's, Pecola's mind frame. Well, what does Junior do? We said Junior scapegoats her, right? Mm -hmm. He wants to kill that cat, and he's going to blame. He targets Pecola because he knows that she's the kind of person his mom will make a hasty generalization about. And and believe, yes, and believe is guilty, right? Which is exactly what happens. He blames it on her. The mom is completely wrong, right? 
she bases her assumption on Piccola's guilt on Piccola's looks. Piccola is completely innocent. She had nothing to do with it. She was trying to save the cat. She was trying to save the cat, exactly. Uh, but the mother decides, uh, you know, how, let's see where it, it happens on page uh, 91. She killed our cat, said Junior. Look. Geraldine went to the radiator and picked up the cat. He was limp in her arms, but she rubbed her face in his fur. She looked at Piccola, saw the dirty torn dress, the plates sticking out on her head, hair matted where the plates had come undone, the muddy shoes with the wad of gum peeping out from between the cheap soles, the soiled socks, one of which had been walked down into the heel of the shoe. She saw the safety pin holding the hem of the dress up. Blah, blah, blah. It goes on for two whole paragraphs of things that she mentioned. So first she sees Piccola. And what does she see about Piccola? She doesn't say she's black. What does she say? She's poor. She's poor. She makes an assumption about her. Oh, this little girl is poor. She must have killed my cat. That's absurd, right? Of course it is. But she then generalizes about all those people. Do you see the logical fallacy that she falls into right after that? She had seen this little girl all her life. Not, and she's not talking about Piccola. She's talking about a big stereotype. People like that, right? Uh, hanging out of windows over saloons in Mobile. So we know it's not Piccola because Piccola lives in Loran. Crawling over the porches of shotgun houses, uh, sitting in bus stations holding paper bags and crying to mothers who kept saying, shut up, hair on comb, dresses falling apart. They were everywhere. They slept six in the bed. She goes on for a whole page. So she's gone off in her mind already about how she's one of those people who does those kinds of things, right? And she says what to her? Get out, you nasty little black bitch. Get out of my house. What a thing to say to a little girl who's innocent. After all, her only guilt is being poor and black, right? And uh, even Jesus, right? The pretty lady's words made the cat fur move. Pecola still calls for the pretty lady. The breath of each word parted the fur. Pecola turned to find the front door and saw Jesus looking down at her with sad and unsurprised eyes. What is it if you're looking at Jesus on your way out the door? Because she must have a, a picture. A picture. staring at you. Jesus is, even Jesus is not on your side. Even Jesus is like, well, that's what, you know, what do you expect, right? <laughs> Ow, right? Do you just have no protector anywhere, right? And again, these eyes, right, of Jesus looking at her, but it's not a gaze of sympathy or don't worry, I'll take care of you, this woman's horrible, just get out of there, right? It's just like, oh, well, sucks to be you, right? Ow. <laughs> Good. I wonder if the picture was with one of them, Jesus, with the blue eyes again. Quite possibly. I don't know. She doesn't really give us a detail there. It would have been interesting to see what she imagined. Uh, okay. Our next section is 87 to 93, which we covered, actually. I think we covered that. Let's move on to 110. I should have two sections that did 110. And if you bear with me, who are my 110 sections that you can ask? Great. Excellent. So let's do 110, but can we back up one page first to 109? I wanted to talk about the end of going to meet Mrs. Breedlove for the first time. Where does that, this is the end of that chapter, before we get into 110. What happens when they go to meet Mrs. Breedlove for the first time? It's the house by the lake. Yes, in the house by the lake. What happens in that passage? Ingrid. They Yes, they drop the pie. It's an awful realization. How does Pauline feel about her work? She loves her work. She loves her work. She doesn't like going. She loves her work, right? And they also realize, I think, um, Claudia and Frida, that the little girl is allowed to call her Pauline. Yes. And her own daughter does not even call her anything but Mrs. Breedlove. Even Piccola calls her Mrs. Breedlove, right? Mm -hmm. And why was that nickname so significant? Okay. Um, I want to say something else. Go ahead. I wonder why Piccola didn't dress the way she did when she went to her mother's job. Like, why she didn't look like on an everyday basis? So dress when she went there. Why she didn't do what? Dress the way she did when she was home. How did she dress? Properly and clean. Like, did she? Yeah, that's what they say was surprising. They first seen her all groomed up like nice. 
everything with my sit on her. Do you think it would have made a difference? Yeah, it would. It really would make a difference. Even though she's ugly, it's just like she's not ugly. She's not poor. Well, should you have to dress up for your mom? No, you shouldn't. To make your mom love you? Should you have to have, have to be clean? No. Gosh, my kids would be in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but she should dress like that every day. Like, not just when she goes to her mother's shop. Well, but she's a kid, right? Shouldn't Doesn't her mom have some responsibility to keep her neat and nice looking? Yeah. It's not her responsibility. She's, she's 11 mm -hmm. years old. She gave her phone. My kids would never shower if I didn't force them and didn't keep <laughs> on them every minute of the day, right? Kids need supervision, right? And how do we know her mom feels about taking care of her own house? She feels down now. She doesn't want to do it. How come? Andrea? She doesn't, um, she's not interested in it anymore. And the other thing that the three girls saw in um, Miss Brida is that they discovered a different side that they have never seen yes. ever with uh, either mother. And that was really ensuring how worthless and insignificant they are. Absolutely. Jeanette. Um, working at the house kind of takes her away from her reality, just yeah. like the little girl, how she calls her Polly, because when she was little, she was never given that nickname. Yeah. That sense of connection with um, her family members. She loves that fact that she's a nickname now. Working for this family gives her a sense of identity. It's her own. She Even if the identity is ideal servant, she's embracing that identity, right? Yeah. Hold that thought for a second. We're, everyone is saying brilliant things, and I want to address them all. Let's let's start with the passage, page 109. The bad thing that ha happens, the climax of that scene is what? The big event that makes everything turn. Why? The cobbler. They dump over the cobbler, right? And remember, uh, who died of a cobbler? Cholie's Chol 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 aunt, right? So I think the message of the book is stay away from cobbler. <laughs> it's bad news, right? But they jump over that cobbler and it stains the little girl's dress, right? And this little girl, sorry, and the floors, and the floors, and burns Pecola rather badly, right? Poor Pecola. Uh, and the mom is furious. Crazy fool, my floor mess. Look what you work. Get on out now. That crazy, my floor, my floor, my floor. Is it her floor? No. No. But she has taken such a sense of ownership over this job and over this house because there her efforts are rewarded. There she sees it tells us reflected back to her a sense of herself that she likes, right? We want to go and do things and be places where we like that reflection that we see of ourselves and what we're doing. And she's appreciated. Her words were hotter and darker than the smoking berries, and we backed away in dread. The little girl in pink started to cry. Notice she doesn't have a name. She's just the little girl in pink. And I would suggest she's almost like the little doll from the life again, right? She's this little girl in pink. And the way that Mrs. Breedlove acts towards her is exactly the way you would act towards a prized baby doll, right? The little, the little girl in pink started to cry. And Mrs. Breedlove turned to her. Hush, baby, hush, come here. Oh, Lord, look at your dress. Don't cry no more. Polly will change it. She went to the sink and turned tap water on a fresh towel. Over her shoulder, she spit out words to us like rotten pieces of apple. Pick up that wash and get on out of here so I can get this mess cleaned up. Now, for the extra A plus honors question of the day, why are her words like rotten pieces of apple? Because Again, remember, what kind of figure, figure speech is that? A Not a metaphor. A simile. simile. Why? Because the word light. Good. Why apple? Is the, 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 oh, where's your hands, please, Dana? Um, I'm thinking this. It's dark on the and lighter on the That's a good idea. Not what I think, but a good idea. Let, let's just brainstorm this a little bit. Okay, Ellen? Rotten pieces of apple. They turn brown. They do turn brown. They're unwanted, but so does rotten mango, right? But it doesn't say rotten mango. Yeah. Um, well, maybe this isn't right. Um, it probably is. Whenever you feel that way, nervous about it, it's probably right. I was thinking because uh, an apple is a fruit of the tree, just like the children are her fruit, and she called them rotten. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. I'm not gonna. Ask, I'm not gonna call anyone from 101. You've got a leg up on this, Ingrid. Because apple symbolizes. 
Exactly. Yes. 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 Satan comes disguised as a snake and says to Eve, hey, take a bite. You'll see. You'll be like God. It'll be great, right? So she does. And the way we often hear that story is then she realizes she's naked, right? And they have to go and run and get fig leaves and cover themselves up and all that stuff. Uh, but it's also a story about uh, disobedience, right? But we say this is the first instance of this is the original fall from innocence. And remember, we said innocence at its root is not knowing, right? So once they take that apple, it's the fruit of knowledge, right? That's what they're getting is knowledge, at knowledge of disobedience, really. And so they take this bite, and all of a sudden they have knowledge that they didn't have before they took the bite. What kind of fall from innocence have our girls had here? What didn't they know two pages ago that now they know and which they didn't know? They know that Mrs. Breedlove doesn't see them in the same respect that she sees the little white girl. Yeah. No. And she fell out the collar and the, the two girls felt like uh, she has a, like a kind of double life. Mm -hmm. She has the love and the beautiful house that maybe she wanted. and. Then when she goes home, it's like that's she doesn't want to be there. It's not her yeah. life. Yeah. She's completely disconnecting with Pekala. She doesn't give her the love. Yeah. She doesn't care if Pekala just burn herself or has something on her dress, but she cares about the little girl. Look at your dress. Yeah. Yeah. How is it to find out that your mother actually loves another little girl a lot more than you? Exactly. And when the two of you are together, she cares more about the little girl's dress than she cares about your burn leg. And she hits you and throws you on the floor and she comforts <coughs> that other little girl. Who doesn't even know that you exist. Don't forget we're going to say Miranda. So while our girls, Claudia, Frida, Pecola, all have a fall from innocence in this scene, notice the little white girl gets to keep her innocence perfectly intact. Who were they, Polly? Don't worry, nun baby. You going to make another pie? Of course I will. Who were they, Polly? Hush, don't worry, nun. They're nobody. You don't yeah. need to worry about them. They're nothing. They're nobody. They don't need to impact your life at all. Yeah. Right? The little white girl gets to be perfectly innocent. Now notice, Maria, we're going to say something? Yeah. Um, I think that maybe they didn't really exactly fall from their innocence at that exact moment because like, an apple just can't automatically be wrong. Like, something has to be inside of it. So maybe they already had something inside of them that, like, made it. Interesting. Bad. So you're saying they already had kind of the seed of that idea, mm -hmm. but now it's that, confirmed. It's all, they already became wrong because of something that they had inside of them. Interesting. Yeah. Although you have to say they might have suspected, but now they're really hit with the reality of it in their faces, right? In a scene where they're treated completely differently, right? Now, notice that periodically throughout the novel, there are several falls from innocence. And they're often, uh, they're often, they often coincide with staining. And by staining, I mean we have staining here, right? The dress is stained by the berries. Why? Because we also talk about the stain of sin, an original sin, right? That knowledge, the stain on us in a way. What other falls from innocence do we have that are accompanied by staining in the book? April. When Kali was younger and he wanted to go have sex with a girl on the bushes. Yeah. Outside, and she would stay in from the blackberries that they were throwing. Yes. What is the fall from this? When Charlie and Darlene, after the funeral, have sex and, and Darlene's dress gets stained by the grapes, they're pelting grapes back and forth. What is the fall from innocence there? Um, I'm not sure if it says like either of them were virgins at the time, but. From the Do you think it's the sex? No. no. Lots of that's our puritanical uh, Americanism coming through. 
I don't think Toni Morrison thinks that the sex is the fall from innocence. Mm -hmm. It's kind of sweet, isn't it? They're both, you know, consenting teens, right? Mm -hmm. They like each other. It's nice. There's nothing bad about it. What turns that bad, that scene? Mm -hmm. Maria. When they get caught by this one. When the hunters come and shine the flashlight on, flashlight on Charlie, right? That's when that whole scene turns ugly, right? That's when I think the fall from innocence comes because it's at that moment where he says, where he thinks to himself, well, I can't even have this for myself with this girl. These white people get to come in and shine a flashlight on me and tell me what to do and I have no power and that's a fall from innocence, right? And how does he react to that? He gets mad at the girl. He gets mad at the girl. What does that remind you of? The cat. The scapegoat and the dandelion in a way, right? Whatever's less, he can't yell at the, he's a, you know, he's a 15 year old black boy. He can't yell at those white hunters, right? That's not gonna go well. They've got guns. Right. His only option, he thinks, of course we know it's not his only option, but he feels like his only option to regain some sense of power because he feels completely powerless at that moment, completely emasculated, is to attack her, right? And to treat her with hatred and blame her, the scapegoat. Right. I think that was really, I think from that moment there, that kind of like really, and then like everything else that happened to him, I think that's with him not really grieving with that, but like kind of really like with setting off, like not so much like setting off, but kind of if you look at it like right there, right there, if you read throughout the book after that, it, it kind of like like flipped off, like just from that right there, like he wasn't like the same, and I think. That's what later, um, like later on down the line, like when he got married. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why his marriage kind of failed and stuff. I mean, I think that was because yeah, he wouldn't we'll talk about that. Yeah, he kills I mean, people. His first sexual experience, though, is even tinged with racism, right? He can't even have this moment that is just for him, right? It's got to infiltrate everything in a negative way. Um, what other instances of standing are there in the book? Nicole gets her period, okay. Anything else? And when he meets his father and he goes and sits on that stuff. Yeah, it's funny because I never help my students out and everyone searches for a euphemism for that, but there's no good way to say it. He goes to the bathroom in his pants, yeah. right? Yeah. Because why? What is that fall? That's the ultimate fall from innocence for Charlie, right? Yeah. Because he's rejected by his yeah. father. Yeah. Just a page before he had been putting all of his hopes and idealism on meeting this father, right? He's just lost his aunt, the one woman who loved him in his life. He puts all of his hopes on this father, right? Even that experience with Darlene, he says, well, my dad would understand because, you know, twisted kid's logic. My dad abandoned my mom, so he's just like me. I'm going to abandon Darlene, and then we'll be just the same, and we'll bond about it, right? And he goes to see his dad, and his dad rejects him. And that is really a big fall from innocence, because at that point, then, we're told he really has nothing much else to lose. He's already feeling unworthy and he's rejected yet again. Right. And yes. Okay, good. Uh, now let's move on. <laughs> Took me a lot. That was a long digression on 109. My 110 people. Let's talk about this section. What is this section? It's called See Mother. Who's Mother? Um, it introduces uh, Colleen William. Yeah. Who is the mother of Nicola? And That's it right. Talks about her deformity, her leg, and how she's insecure, she messes up her life. A also, cavity in her tooth. Yeah. Talks about a cavity in her tooth. Yes. Um, so this is the Pauline, this is young Pauline section, you could call it, or Pauline at the movies, I call it. Yeah. <laughs> or Pauline at the movies maybe a little bit later. This is the young Pauline, right? And what was she like as a young woman? She had a messed up foot. She wasn't really that happy. She was always moving, like, from place to place. She moved, like, three times. She was born in um, Alabama. Yeah. And what does she have to do? What does she do with she her days? She had to clean and stuff. She was um, isolated from her family members. Yeah. Um, she finds herself, uh, you know, having pleasures doing other things, imaginary. What does she like to do, Trevon? Um, I believe she likes to, um, like, think she was a movie star. All right, that's a little bit later, but she does have an active fantasy life. Mm -hmm. You're at just a page before that. Let's look at 111 for a second. Oh, organizing. Into organizing. Yeah. She has a little bit of OCD going on, I think. She's a little bit obsessive compulsive. She likes organizing things, right? One thing before that, how does she feel about her foot? It's a deformity. 
Yeah. It's a deformity. What does she blame on it, Andres? She feels like that ruins a lot of what her life would have been if, I guess, like, it really impacted her life. Like, people yeah. treated her differently, and they, um, they made that the, like, the main thing to focus on. Yeah. Her general feeling of separateness and unworthiness she blamed on her foot. Who does that remind you of? Picola. Picola. If I only had blue eyes, my whole life would be different. It's from her mother. It's from her mother, right? If my foot was straight, somebody would save me the neck bone or the wind or care to cook the collards from the rice, right? Or I forget the example, something like that, right? No one notices her. She doesn't make an impact, right? And she blames it on her foot, that one specific thing. Restricted as a child to this cocoon of her family spinning. Notice her family is like a spider web around her, a cocoon, and she's trapped. She cultivated quiet and private pleasures. She liked most of all to arrange things, to line things up in rows, jars on shelves at canning, peach pits on the step, sticks, stones, leaves, and the members of her family let these arrangements be. When by some accident somebody scattered her rows, they always stopped to retrieve them for her. And she was never angry, for it gave her a chance to rearrange them again. Whatever portable plurality she found, she organized into neat lines according to their size, shape, or gradations of color. Just as she, <coughs> excuse me, just as she would never align a pine needle with the leaf of a cottonwood tree, she would never put the jars of tomatoes next to the green beans. During all of her four years of going to school, she was enchanted by numbers and depressed by words. She missed, without knowing what she missed, paints and crayons. Who misses paints and crayons? What kind of person? Artists. I'm going to make the case for you that Pecola is really a frustrated artist. When we hear her speak about things, when we hear her talk about memories, she's a very visual person. She talks disarranging of things. Everything has its order according to their size, shape, or gradations of color is an effort for her, you know, she doesn't have crayons, she doesn't have paint, so what does she have? The materials she has are the natural world and these cans to arrange in pretty patterns, because I think she's an artist. Keep your finger there for a second and skip forward to 115. When she talks about Chali, think about this from the mind of an artist. When I first see Chali, this is her speaking, because we know that's in quotes and it's in italics, when I first see Chali, I want you to know it was like all the bits of color from that time down home when all us children went berry picking after a funeral. And I put some in the pocket of my Sunday dress and they mashed up and stained my hips. My whole dress was messed with purple and it never did wash out. Not the dress nor me. I could feel that purple deep inside me. And that lemonade mama used to make when Pap came in out of the fields, it'd be cool and yellowish with seeds floating near the bottom. And that streak of green them June bugs made on the trees that night we left from down home. All of them colors was in me, just sitting there. So when Chali came up and tickled my foot, it was like them berries that lemonade, them streaks of green the June bugs made all come together. Chali was then then with real light eyes. He used to whistle, and when I heard him, shivers came on my skin. Maria. Um, I feel like this is kind of like portrait of the artist as a young man, like how he sees everything and color and every little thing, like the mud and the ground and like bees buzzing around, everything Great. is just colorful. Yeah, she's completely aware of her physical environment, right? In a way that someone who's not a visual, now we know that people are, some people are visual learners, some people uh, learn by um, hearing things, you know, there's different ways that we process. And she's a visual person, clearly, and she has the heart of an artist, listen to that description. And we know also that words depress her. She, she relates much more to visuals. She can't articulate her, herself. It also might explain why she loves going to the movies so much, because they're these, and why they're so powerful for her, because they're visual. What else does she describe as bits of color and rainbow? Ingrid. Her hubby's eyes. Charlie's eyes. Her hubby's sexy. Sex. We're grown-ups now, we're in college, you can say it. Sex. She thinks about sex in terms of colors, right? At the end of the, uh, at the, end of the chapter, she tells us she kind of, the one thing she missed was the rainbow, but not even that so much anymore, right? <laughs> now she's waiting for Jesus, right, she says. Um, but she thinks of everything in terms of, uh, of art, right? It gives us a little, another perspective on her as a person, and maybe why she also likes the beauty and appreciates the beauty of the house that she works in so much, because she is sensitive to those things. This is a little aside, but what happens, remember the couch episode? Mm -hmm. 
What happened with that couch that they got the breed loves at? The day it was delivered, it was split up the bed. So how does that make Charlie feel? Powerless. Powerless, right? He's emasculated, he's powerless, he's humiliated. He can't get the drivers to take it back. They say, it's your problem, right? You're looking forward to this couch, he's still paying it off, and he can take no pleasure from it because it's got this big split up the back, right? So it's a constant reminder that their house isn't nice. And you know, it's interesting, they've done studies. They hit a camera somewhere, and they went to like a public park a section where a lot of people went and locked up their bikes. This is true, I'm not making this. And uh, they put these flyers, pamphlets, on people's bikes. And they were kind of big, so the only way you could bike away was if you put those pamphlets somewhere, right? So they also took the trash can away. So people's only choice was to either fold them up and take them, or to throw them on the ground, right? And they noticed that almost without fail, if the area was all clean, people took the pamphlets, folded them up, put them in their pockets, and rode away. But if it was dirty, but if it was dirty and there were some on the floor already, everybody threw theirs on the floor. Isn't that interesting how human nature says, and I think it's related to me, it's related to the breed loves, like what's the point? It's already dirty, it's never gonna be nice, what's the point, it's hopeless, right? And it speaks kind of to that general hopelessness. Of course, all of you need to be that person who says, I don't care if it's dirty, I'm gonna take my because <laughs> that's the right thing to do, right? Um, but it's a constant in their life, it's a constant negative reinforcement, right? Um, I forget why I went on that digression for a second, but let's go to 113 and Pauline's fantasies. Just to say that her, for an artist's sensibility, right, having a nice place, having something clean and beautiful would be even more important to her, perhaps. And the fact that the storefront isn't might be even more depressing for her, and she might take it more personally. So my group, uh, she's 15 years old, the twins have left school and gone off to work now, so she's by herself, and what does she start to think about? Love, as 15-year-old girls are wont to do, right? Perfectly normal. Pauline was 15, still keeping house, but with less enthusiasm. Fantasies about men and love and touching were drawing her mind and hands away from her work. Changes in weather began to affect her, as did certain sights and sounds. These feelings translated themselves to her in extreme melancholy. She thought of the death of newborn things, lonely roads, and strangers who appear out of nowhere simply to hold one's hand. Woods in which the sun was always setting. In church especially did these dreams grow. The songs caressed her, and while she tried to hold her mind on the wages of sin, her body trembled for redemption and salvation, a mysterious rebirth that would simply happen, with no effort on her part. In none of her fantasies was she ever aggressive. She was usually idling by the riverbank or gathering berries in a field, when a someone appeared with gentle and penetrating eyes, who, with no exchange of words, understood and before whose glance her foot straightened and her eyes dropped. Who is she imagining? Charlie. Charlie. Well, she doesn't know Charlie yet. Well, a stranger. A stranger. Who's the stranger for a girl who's 15? Prince it's Prince Charming, isn't it? Prince Charming. We're told by all those fantasy, you know, all those um, fairy tales, right? You don't have to do anything. You just sit in the tower waiting, right? <laughs> and he's going to ride up, and he's going to rescue you from, from your own personal hell, whatever that is. And for her, it's being stuck in this house, right? And he's going to, the sun's going to be always setting, because that's how we imagine they ride off into the sunset, right? And he's going to take your hand, he's going to protect you, and it's all going to be beautiful, right? The someone had no face, no form, no voice, no odor. He was a simple presence an all-embracing tenderness with strength and a promise of rest. It did not matter that she had no idea of what to do or say to the presence. After the wordless knowing and the soundless touching, her dreams disintegrated, but the presence would know what to do. She had only to lay her head on his chest and he would lead her away to the sea, to the city, to the woods, forever and happily ever after. Now notice, when you're reading Tony Morrison, the trick with Morrison is, you have to notice the juxtaposition of the paragraphs to see how she's making these connections. What is the next paragraph about? And once you see that next paragraph, you make the connection. Page 113. Going to church. Going to church. Yeah, she, she hears Ivy, this woman named Ivy, singing in church. And 
She fantasizes, we know, even more about Prince Charming at church. What is she singing about, Ida? We have the lyrics to the song on 114. About Jesus, the Lord, precious Lord, lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. Uh, like for salvation, she's looking for someone to save her. Yeah, so who's Jesus? Jesus is Prince Charming. She's imagining Prince Charming as Jesus, right? Because that's what she hears. Listen. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me on. And this idea is foregrounded in the paragraph before by what? By the fact that she capitalizes presence in simple presence. What do we usually capitalize? God, right? We always capitalize God's name. So by capitalizing presence, which is not a noun that we normally capitalize, it, I think, gets us used to this idea that God is, uh, that Jesus is Prince Charming for her, in her imagination, right? Uh, he's the one who's going to make it all better. And it also explains a little bit how she feels about religion as an adult woman. How does she feel about her religion? Jeremy. How so? Explain. For her suffering, it's like retro. It's like a, I don't know what that's called. She's got a whole yeah. She well, she's got kind of a whole martyr complex going on, doesn't she? Yeah. You know, she's like, oh, Charlie's my cross to bear. He's my crown of thorns. You know, that's why she likes having him around because it makes her look good as a martyr, and she's just kind of saving herself for Jesus, right? When she finally goes off to meet her maker, right? That's what she's thinking of. Oh, I have to ignore all this right now, but it's making me a better person, right? Uh, good, good. All right, uh, let's move forward to 122. Oh, one thing. How does Charlie, so then this sets up, I want to say one thing. So I'm waiting for Prince Charming, I'm waiting for Jesus, and then Charlie shows up, right? So her mind is completely, like, she's ready for somebody. She's standing by the riverbank, and you know, she's ready when he shows up. And how does he act towards her foot? Anna. It makes it like an acid. It makes her feel special about it. Exactly, on page 116. Instead of ignoring her infirmity, pretending it was not there, he made it seem like something special and endearing. For the first time, Pauline felt that, she, that her bad foot was an asset. Take that, Wendy McElroy, and victims from birth, right? <laughs> she feels good about it. Isn't that what true love's supposed to be? That the other person makes you feel good about whoever you are? Doesn't make you feel bad or lacking in any way? So how would you characterize their relationship in the beginning? Is it a good relationship? Yeah. It is. It's a pretty good relationship, actually. What makes it go bad, do you think? Alcohol doesn't help. Um, he's, uh, his pain of all these like, years of him being helpless mm. actually catches up to him. And yeah. he, he doesn't know how to deal with it and how to overcome it, and it just becomes worse and worse. Oh, I was going to say her tooth. And her tooth. And her tooth. So that's a good segue to the movie section. Who had the movie section? Pauline at the movies. 122. They move up north. She's lonely. 122. So that's that's why she started to go to movies too, because of the loneliness she yeah. felt. And um, she was kind of sucked, sucked, sucked up into the world of beauty yeah. and um, introduced it to the world of beauty. And then she started to care for her appearance and started to mimic the Hearing of the movie, but then that's when that's that's when she lost her teeth. And it's almost because she's been going to the movies that the loss of that tooth is so painful yes. for her, right? Yes. Let's look at one twenty-two for a second. Can I interrupt you for one second? Okay. Uh, she starts going to the movies instead. There in the dark. And how does Charlie feel about her being pregnant? He's happy, right? This is a hiatus in their relationship. They're getting along. She, he, the book tells us he surprised her by being happy, right? So they're getting along. Along with the idea, okay, sorry. There in the dark, her memory was refreshed, and she succumbed to her earlier dreams. 
And we know what those earlier dreams are because we just talked about them, right? The Prince Charming, all that. And certainly, you remember that movie, Imitation of Life, right? The idea of romantic love there glorified every time Stephen Archer walks on set, there's his theme song that plays, there's the big moon in the background, they're looking at the Hudson River in the back, right? It's all beautiful and glamorous. Along with the idea of romantic love, she was introduced to another, physical beauty. Probably the most destructive ideas in the history of human thought. Why are romantic love and beauty, physical beauty, the most destructive ideas ever? It makes you doubt, for sure, right? If I said to you all, what's a romantic date? Men and women, what would, you know, what would you say? Take her to your grandma's house. Your grandma's house? Okay, dinner, what kind of dinner? Is it, is it McDonald's? McDonald's. No. Burger. No, right? Fancy restaurant, restaurant. what else? What else? Candy, flowers. 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 What kind of flowers? Candy lines? Roses. Roses, right? Roses. What else? What are you drinking? Soda? Wine. 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 Champagne. Champagne. Right? <laughs> what are you drinking? <laughs> what do we have? What else? Chocolate, right? Isn't there chocolate somewhere? Why did they have her I said oh, romantic. Oh, 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 Fly you to France on this private jet. Like we even think of romantic places, right? Beach, Paris, right? Um, there are other places that are not so romantic, right? But we all know that, don't we? And we're all very different. We've all had very different experiences. I can tell you, I've been married happily for 17 years. I have yet to see rose petals on my bed. But, I'm still, but I still know about that because of what? How do I know that? They have to be. It doesn't happen to me, so how do I know about it? From the movie. From the movie. I've seen the movies. I've seen those commercials, right? If we, if I said to you, right, if someone tells you, tells you oh, so and so just got engaged, what's the first thing you look at? The ring. the ring, the ring, right? And if the ring is really big, you say, "Wow, he must really love you," right? And if the ring is tiny, oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Isn't that sweet, right? Because we think, because this is craziness, right? We all know perfectly well. We're smart people. We all know perfectly well that the size of the diamond has absolutely no correlation with the length of your relationship or love, right? We know that. But it shows you the know rich. Yes, yeah, it shows the rich. But that doesn't mean you're, look at Kim Kardashian. She's yeah. the hugest rock on the planet. How long did her hair? 60 days? Something like that? <laughs> 70, I'm not up on my Kim, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we all know that. And how, and, but we all, everyone says we look at the ring, right? Because it's a symbol. And, this causes unhappiness, Toni Morrison would say, because, let's hear why. Both these ideas, physical beauty and romantic love, both originated in envy. Oh, her ring's bigger than mine, right? I liked my ring, but her ring didn't even got bigger. Thrived in insecurity. How come he didn't bring me roses tonight? He brought me roses last week, right? And ended in disillusion. In equating physical beauty with virtue, she stripped her mind, bounded, and collected self-contempt by the heat. Now, we may think we're beyond all this, but we are still equating physical beauty with virtue, the idea that beauty means good, right? You just have to look at Victoria's Secret's angels, right? Yeah. Those women are so perfect, right? They must be angels. They must be from heaven. Isn't that the idea? Yeah. And I'm sure you've all heard that expression, ugly as sin, right? that somehow ugly is sinful or bad. Of course we know that's not true. In fact, I would argue probably it's more likely the opposite, that those really great looking people are probably not so nice, but I don't know that for sure. But it plays on our minds, this stuff, doesn't it? She regarded love, she forgot lust and simple caring for. She regarded love as possessive mating and romance as the goal of the spirit. 
It would be for her a wellspring from which she would draw the most destructive emotions, deceiving the lover and seeking to imprison the beloved, curtailing freedom in every way. She was never able, after her education in the movies, to look at a face and not assign it some category in the scale of absolute beauty. And the scale was one she absorbed in full from the silver screen. There at last were the darkened woods, the lonely roads, the river banks, the gentle knowing eyes. There the flawed became whole, the blind sighted, and the lame and halt drew away their crutches. The death was dead, and people made every gesture in a cloud of music. There, the black and white images came together, making a magnificent whole, all projected through the ray of light from above and beyond. If you are getting all your ideas from the movies, right, how is that romantic, how is the idea of romantic love destructive to our own relationships, Serena? It's unrealistic standard. Unrealistic, right? People can do things on the movie, right? And it's the same with physical beauty, isn't it? And I think it's even worse today, right? Because we have all that Photoshop that goes on, right? And it's no different for the women than it is for the men. For the men, we know all men are supposed to be buff, right? They gotta take their shirts off all the time. Six packs. Yeah, six packs. You know, it's, it's exactly, so I want you to be thinking about that. As you go off and analyze your ads, right? You're gonna be ripping out ads uh, for when you come in next time. And I want you to pick out for your four to bring in. Just think about it. How do we all know about this size of the diamond? Well. De Beers, which is the big diamond company, had this brilliant, absolutely brilliant strategy where they said, well, we've all heard of diamonds forever. First of all, we all... It's a girl's best friend. It's a girl's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Not a man's, right? <laughs> uh, but De Beers started this campaign where they actually said, true love is worth, I think it's two or three months salary, right, of the man's salary. Which is absolutely brilliant, because whether you're making minimum wage or you're a multimillionaire, we all know what two or three months are. So it gives men a guideline, right? Because you don't want to be wrong about it. You don't want to pick out the wrong size, because I would send the wrong message, right? So it's got a whole culture, a whole generation of people buying into the hype that you need to spend money on a diamond in order to profess your love, which is crazy, right? And you'll see so many things, once you look at it with that critical eye, when you start ripping out your ads, you're gonna see a lot of things like that, a lot of logical houses. Okay, I'm gonna let you go, and I will see you next week. Please bring these books, your blue eyes back, if you're not done with them. We're gonna finish up the book on Tuesday, and bring West back, and we'll have to group it up, please. And the West back, because we're gonna go over very carefully, uh, chapter 18, and we're gonna look at the picture. I don't know.